Have I told you about my grandkids recently? <laughs> Probably. I, what, I, what you may not know is that my daughter is expecting, and the due date is Tuesday. And so hopefully sometime this week, uh, we'll have a little baby boy who comes our way, and uh, I'll be able to have pictures for you next week. Uh, well, because you know, I know you're going to want to see the most good-looking uh, b- baby boy you've ever seen before. Now, why do I even bring that up? Because I love my grandkids. But also, because the moment I get that little baby, and they're going to hand it to me, and I'm going to look at it, that little baby is not going to look at me and say, Saba, my diaper is wet, and I'm hungry. Would, I'd like a steak, medium, well, all right, would you go fix it right now? He's not going to do that. He's going to scream his head off and say, I don't know what the problem is, but you better fix it, right? I mean, that's what babies do. Babies just know when they're uncomfortable. Babies know when they need something, and they, they just shout. They scream, and moms, and it's amazing to me the new languages that are, that are discovered in, at home between moms and dads and their kids. They know what they're saying. Then eventually that baby starts to grow, and that baby will be able to say words. It might not sound like words in the beginning, but they are. And they're, they're telling you what they need. And, and then those babies are able to sometimes get to the point where they actually start dressing themselves. And, and they'll run around and, and they, they'll eat more than just milk. I mean, they'll, they're able to eat because they got teeth now. And, and they just continue to grow. And that, every parent wants that to be the case. We want them to grow up. We want them to be able to walk on their own. We want them to be able to meet new friends on their own. And we, we want them to thrive and excel. And we, we, we want them to make a difference with their life. Guess what? That's what God has in store for you, his baby. You, when a person meets Christ and they come to know him personally, immediately you become a babe, the Bible says, in Christ. And you have some of the same urges, same needs and all that stuff that a, a physical baby would have. But spiritually, there are other ways to communicate that. And little by little, you'll grow in that as you allow God to grow you. What, what I talked to you about last week, spiritual growth, I want us to continue this this morning. I want to talk to you about how important it is to grow spiritually and some of those things that will enable you to grow spiritually. But, but you need to know it's about learning some of the basics and then learning how to apply the basics. You remember last week we looked at a verse in Colossians chapter 1? And look inside your worship guide right now. There's a, there's a listening guide. It's white. Pull it out. What you're going to find is on the back side of it at the very bottom is a little box and it has the verse that we looked at last week. It's Colossians 1 verse 9. I want you to look at it one more time before we go on and jump into the new stuff. It says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask. Stop right there. What Paul is saying is in this letter, he says, I'm really concerned about you. I want you to grow spiritually. I want you to become what God intended for you to become. So I've been praying for you all the time that that would happen. That's what he's saying right there. Then it goes on. We have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So what is he talking about here? Is he just coming up with different words that that sound like it's growth? No, no. These are two specific words. When it says spiritual wisdom, that's the word Sophia in Greek, which means basic principles. The word Sophia is, is, is the truths of the living God. So he says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom, Sophia, and understanding. That's a different word, synesis, which means you know how to take Sophia and apply it to your life. So if you didn't get anything that I said last week, last week's message was this. God wants you to know the truth and apply it to your life. When you do that, you will experience growth, spiritual growth. If you want to know what does it take to grow closer to God, what does it take to become more mature in your faith, what does it take to look like what, you, what God always intended for you to look like spiritually, it's all about taking this Sophia, the basic concepts, the basic principles of God's Word, and applying to your life. That's it. Now, if you're not careful, you're going to think that the church back in the time of Paul and the apostles was a perfect church. I mean... They never did anything wrong. I mean, it was the church. The, and they, you know, they were closest to when Jesus was there and all that. They, they, did you realize that the church was very imperfect back then? Do, do you realize that most of the letters, the, the epistles that we have in the New Testament, are letters ri- written by Paul or John or Peter to deal with problems in the church? Over and over again, th- th- these problems are identified, and the disciples say, we need to come alongside. Just because you got problems doesn't mean you can't grow spiritually. 
Just because you got problems and you're not doing it right now doesn't mean that you can't turn around and start growing spiritually. But see, we think that our churches and our times are much different than theirs. And we're bad, worse off than they were because we're just so far removed from it. And there's really not much hope for us. So we might as well just give up. We'll do the best we can. But we just know that there's no way we'll really grow like they used to grow. We'll never experience the same kinds of things that they experienced there. We, we couldn't do that. And that's just not true. God wants us to realize that spiritual growth is necessary because we tend to become too fleshy. And we respond out of our impulses, our flesh. And God says, I don't want that to be the case in your life. I want you to mature. I want you to grow. I want you to become wise and discerning. That's, and he did that in the, in the New Testament church. But he, he certainly wants to do that in our church now. But we, just, we think that that church back then, they had so much more going for it than us. Not true. They had the same kinds of problems. In fact, let me show you another passage. Turn the sheet over again. And at the top of that sheet that I just told you to pull out is a passage in Hebrews chapter 5. And I, I want to read this passage to you. But before I do, let me give you a little history here. The, the reason why it's called the letter of the Hebrews is because it's written to people who are very familiar with the Hebrew faith, the Jewish faith. He, he refers to it throughout the, the whole letter. It's always a, references to the old covenant and the way they did sacrifices and, and the, the rest, the, the Sabbath rest and Melchizedek and you name it, all the way down. Uh, Jews would understand what, what they're talking about there. If you weren't a Jew, you'd read through it and say, what's he talking about? What's that mean? So that's, just know that's part of the background. So he's writing this, this epistle to say one thing. He says, Jesus is better. That's it. Other commentators would say that the theme for the book is the supremacy of Christ. It's, it's always how Christ is greater than. And that's every chapter. For example, when you go to chapter 1 in Hebrews, it's going to talk to you about angels. It's in chapter 1 when it tells you that you have guardian angels, those of you who are believers. The Bible says those who follow after Jesus have these guardian angels. If you ever wondered if that was in the Bible, it is. But he's talking about the, all these angels and what angels do. And then toward the end of chapter, or in the middle of chapter 2, he says, but Jesus is far better than the angels. And then he goes on and talks about Abraham and Moses a little bit, about the law and how God has handpicked the people and he's given them the law and not anybody else, nobody else had all that stuff. Then, but then it adds this little phrase and it says, but Jesus is far superior and you want to trust him. And then he goes on and talks about the Sabbath. You know how, how uh, in the very beginning God created heavens and earth seven days and then he rested. Uh, and then it talks about the Sabbath, how we're there to observe the Sabbath. That's one of the Ten Commandments. He says, all of that's good stuff. It'll help you grow, but understand that Jesus is better. And then he goes on, and when you get to chapter 5, and he wants to talk about this priest that's uncovered a couple of times in the Old Testament. His name is Melchizedek. Later on in chapter 7 or 8 of Hebrews, it talks about how Jesus came in the lineage, the priestly lineage of Melchizedek. Melchizedek had no beginning and no end, it says. And so you wonder, oh my goodness, well then maybe that was Jesus way back there in Abraham's time. Could have been. We just don't know because he named himself Melchizedek. Well, listen to what he says in Hebrews chapter 5. This has everything to do with spiritual growth. Listen to this. Hebrews 5, 11. Concerning him, Melchizedek, we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Does that sound familiar? Does that ever happen here? What he's saying is, I'd like to go on, and I'd like to teach you more, and I'd like to lead you closer to, to growing spiritually, but you have become dull of hearing. Now, the word dull of hearing comes from a Greek word, nothros, which means a lot of different things. It, it means that you've come to the point where things of God are just boring to you. That's nothros. You, you don't even care. You don't really care about things of God. So I'm nothros, and that's what he's saying. The reason I can't teach you about Melchizedek is because you don't really care. Or another way to translate nothros is the word, is the word um, forgetful. You just don't remember. And so, you know, it's not important to you because you don't remember all that. And God says, the reason I can't take you any further is because you don't take the time to try to remember those things. You just kind of lay them over there. I mean, there's a lot of meanings for this word nothros. Bottom line is, God says, when you come to the place of nothros, it's a decision you have to make whether or not you want to grow again. Because if you're full of nothros, you're apathetic. You're just, you put distance between you and God and say, I just don't have time for this anymore. God says, I want there to be much more to it than that. Don't give up so easily on growing spiritually. Then he goes on. 
Listen to this. He says, since you have become dull or not the of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be what? Yeah, what? Teachers. It's kind of hard to say it because you're thinking, he may be talking about me. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone else to teach you. The elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. What he's saying is this. You're given every opportunity to grow spiritually. And when you become nothras, which means you've rejected those ways to grow spiritually, you've decided to do it your own way, do it in your own timing, then you're nothras. He says, when you, when you choose to do that, he says, what makes it especially bad is you should be at the point now where you should be able to talk to others about your faith in Christ. It's not about getting more training. You've, you've lived with the Lord. You've been growing. You started as a little baby, and now you've got teeth, and you're able to eat a little bit of meat. And, you, I mean, you're able to run. I mean, you're able to talk. He's saying you ought to use all those things to influence people and help them to see who Jesus is. He says, but because you've insisted on being nothros, he says, you've deteriorated. It's like, sort of like stepping on an escalator. And you're going up the escalator, escalator, and it dawns on you, you left a package down at the bottom, so you turn around, and you try to go, but the escalator keeps pushing you back, and you're going, you just do your best, but you're just maintaining. You're going to have to let it take you all the way to the top and catch the one that goes down. Same thing in spiritual growth. God wants you to grow. But oftentimes, with our nothros, we're turned around opposite and going the, um, the wrong direction on the escalator. God says, I want you to grow. I want you to know how to grow. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend time doing that. But let me show you one other thing here. Look at that passage again one last time. Look at verse 14. Or no, verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. We've been talking about what it means to be a babe in Christ. And you need milk in the very beginning. You need milk uh, to help you to grow as an infant in the Lord. He says, "For but solid food is for the mature, who because of what? Practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Does that sound familiar? Like taking the Sophia and applying it? That's what he's saying here again. He says the mature, the ones who eat solid food, are the ones who because, because of practice, who have applied it, because of practice, they have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Paul, I think Paul wrote this. We don't know because he, he doesn't identify himself here, but there's just too much uh, of Paul in it, it looks like to me. Paul is, is saying, I, it, I want you to know God's plan for you is to grow spiritually. But you need to know it is very easy to become nothros. It's so easy to become uh, to the point where you just don't care or you don't want to take the time to do it and you'll just do everything else. You'll say yes to, to yourself, to the flesh, and say no to God because you just don't have time for it right now. God says, no, I want you to grow spiritually because there are assignments I have for you down the road that you have to grow to be ready to deal with. Last week, I said it really helps to have a coach to, to at least identify those, those ways to grow spiritually. Well, I want to be your coach this morning, and I want to show you how to do that. Now, you look on your note sheet there. You notice it's got five, five points already on there. Those are the ones I covered last week. These are five coaching tips. I want us to start with number six. If you weren't here last week, you can, you can always go online and listen to it uh, on our archives. Number six, this is a way to grow spiritually. This is a guarantee. You want to grow spiritually? Number six, you will grow spiritually when you choose to spend time with other followers of Jesus. You will grow spiritually when you choose to spend time with other followers of Jesus. You cannot live the Christian life as a lone ranger. Some people want to do that, especially introverts. Introverts think, no, I can do this on my own. I don't need any help. You, know, you can't because you need others who will sharpen you. You'll become dull. You'll become nothros. And, and let me show you what I'm talking about. Proverbs 27, verse 17. Listen to this. God says, iron sharpens iron. We'd all agree to that. I mean, if you want to sharpen a knife, you, you, you slice it against a, a stone here or, or, another, or another piece of metal, okay? And it's going to sharpen it to, to where it gets to the point where you put your finger on it, it could cut you. All right? It's saying, iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. God is saying here, I want you to know it takes people to keep you sharp. If you don't hang around people and, and, and do what's necessary to go spiritually around people, then you're going to find that you're left hanging and you're going to be frustrated. You're going to wonder, where's God? What's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? When God's saying, I want you to be sharp. 
So you can pick up on those things. I, from the very beginning, I mean, God has put people in my life to help me there. I didn't understand this concept. I mean, all I know is that I became a Christian when, in the middle of my college years. And I was coming from an, being an atheist to a Christian. I didn't have church background to, to teach me all this other stuff. And so I'm wondering, okay, what am I supposed to do? I give my life to Christ, and I did it. Nobody led me to Jesus. I just grabbed a Bible. I, I stole a Bible, actually. and I took a Bible, and I started reading it for a month and a half, reading the Gospels. And when I finished reading the Gospels, all of a sudden it dawned on me that the Bible wasn't a rule book. It was a book about how to have a relationship with God. And so there in the privacy of my room, when nobody's looking, because I didn't want anybody to know I was reading this book. So I'm reading this, and I said, God, if that's the way you are, I'd like to know you. So I'll give you all that's of me, but I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to play the game. I'm not going to start going to church and be like those so-called Christians are, the hypocrites that I always run into. He says, you've got you to open my eyes and help me see that you're for real. And for the next week, my life just ra did a radical turnaround. The end of the week comes, and the guy that was instrumental in my getting a hold of that Bible, his name's Bob, he had become a Christian three years before when he was in high school. He was a good friend of mine. I knew he was different. He's the only guy that I looked at and said, your life really has changed. So I remember I went to him. And he started asking me questions, and I, I wanted to keep it hush-hush, secret. Didn't want to tell anybody about my conversion. And he just flat out said, listen, I had a dream last night, and in the dream God said that you'd given your life to Christ. And I just want to ask, have you given your life to Christ? And at that moment, it was just God was speaking to me saying, okay, it's time for you to admit it or forget it. And I gulped, and I said, yeah, I did. And he says, I knew it. I could see a difference already. I said, what do you mean? But see, at that moment, it was just like the dam broke open and I could ask somebody questions. I had so many questions because I couldn't understand all these things that were going on in my life. And so I started opening it up and he just, and he spent that whole night, that was like a, a Thursday night and we were up all night long into the next morning, just question after question after question. And he just, he just put up with it. And then we left, I had to go to work, he did too, and the next night we met together again and he did the same thing with me, he just kind of put, me on, put his arm around me and said, let's just talk, and we talked more and more. And I, what he was doing was sharpening me, because my blade was very dull, I mean, it was just new, and it, but he was answering the questions. <coughs> then there was another guy named Tony, who was in the Air Force, and he was assigned there at Fort Stewart, um, and, and he was leading a Bible study at this coffee house. And when he found out about me, Bob had gone to tell him, he said, you need to come to the Bible study that we have here every time. I said, what's that? And he says, come, I'll show you. And I'd come, and we'd sit down, and there'd be a crowd of maybe 15 or 20 uh, other students about my age that were there. And he'd go, and he'd tell me stories about this guy named Abraham and Moses. I think, I've never heard of these characters. But that, what, what an incredible story. And he said, oh, there's so much more to it, and it all applies to you. And then I was just all ears, ready to listen. And so they, they'd invite me to every time they do anything. Uh, they wanted me to come along just to experience it. We had this thing called Jesus 73. It was like a Christian Woodstock up in Pennsylvania. And I remember we all hopped in the car. I said, I've got a car. We'll drive. And we drove all the way up to Pennsylvania, went to Jesus 73. I couldn't believe my eyes. All these people loved Jesus. They were radically converted. And the people talking were giving us insights on how to take it to the next level. And I'm thinking, look at this. And, and then my two buddies, Bob and Tony, were there saying, hey, what do you think? What do you think? This is cool. And then there's a downside too. We come back and they're talking to each other and, and I'm thinking, they, why are they leaving me out of the conversation? Well, they're talking about a book that they've been reading, one guy's been reading uh, by an author, uh, Watchman Nee. And so here, uh, I said, hey, you're talking about this book. Can I have a copy? He says, no, you shouldn't read this book right now. You're not ready for it. And I'm thinking, what? I am so ready for that. And he says, no, you're not ready for it. You've got to grow a little bit more before you'll understand some of these concepts. So when they left, what did I do? To the bookstore I went. I got that book. I pulled it open, and I tried to read it, and I said, I don't understand anything that's here. Because <laughs> I'm still a babe. I'm growing up. Maybe I'm four or five years old in the Lord now. I mean, sort of. But, but they, were, they stuck with me. They were stuck with me, and then there were times. But they liked being around me, too, because they said I was pretty enthusiastic and excited about this new life. And, and they were just kind of down in the dumps because bad things had been happening to them recently. And, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you, there are two kinds of Christians, the kinds that look like they've been sucking on a sour pickle and the kind that are just excited and never heard of a pickle. You know, it's, it's one of those things. And they said, you stick around with us. We'll teach you some things. I actually, because I saw their countenance, I was praying, and I said, God, I want to be mature like them. So God... If to be mature like them, you've got to take away all the blessings so I can be, be grumpy, uh, grumpy like they are, then take them away. And then some bad things began to happen to me. And I became a whole lot more sober-minded, if you will, about that. And, and God was teaching me a whole other lesson in that. Then I moved back up to Georgia Tech. I'm, I'm a student at Georgia Tech, go to Atlanta, and I feel like there's not a single other believer 
in all of Atlanta, Georgia, because the previous year, I was very aggressive. I was a, an atheistic evangelist looking for Christians. And whenever I'd find a Christian, I'd talk to them and ask them all these questions that they didn't have answers to, and I would try to persuade them to stop believing a bunch of garbage like that. So when I come back to Atlanta, I'm thinking there's not another Christian anywhere around because all the ones that used to be, they aren't anymore. So I said, I can't do this on my own. I, ne I need to have a friend who's a Christian. And so I led my roommate to Jesus. And he became a Christian. He was so excited. And we started having Bible study together. Now, neither one of us is trained or equipped or we didn't know what we're doing. But we just knew that it's, the truth was in the Bible. So we just study it together. And then we started leading the rest of the guys up and down the hallway to Christ and inviting them to come to the Bible study. I mean, it's just all, we were always and in time together. Then I, I learned that there's this group called Campus Crusade for Christ uh, uh, that was on our campus, the Navigators, and I would go to their meetings too. And, and every time i get around them, they'd sharpen me up even more. And then the best thing that ever happened to me is I met my future wife. She was going to nursing school there in Atlanta. She was the most spiritually mature person I'd ever met in my life, and she's beautiful. And, and God was saying, she's yours. And I said, I'm in, I'm in. And I, I just hung around her. And the more I hung around her, the more I grew. And she loved being around me because I was enthusiastic and fearless, you know, about the things of God, And even though I didn't know that much. But, but again, once again, I was rubbing shoulders with another follower of Jesus. When I look back at my life, and I, I'm just trying to ask the questions, you know, how was I feeling at times like that? And I got all these journals that I was keeping, just a record, a daily record of what I went through. And I'm thinking, I had the same struggles that everybody else has, but I was passionate about Jesus and running into people, meeting with people, spending time with people who knew Jesus too. All that's under this point. You'll grow spiritually when you choose to spend time with other followers of Jesus. Listen to what Paul said to Timothy. Timothy was, was taught by Paul and left in Ephesus to be the pastor. Timothy was probably in his 20s. Most of the other folks that, in, that were there were older than that. So he's, he's constantly telling Timothy, look, you're not too young, just act wisely here. And so then he says these words, 2 Timothy 2.22. Now, flee from youthful lusts. Now, that does, he is talking about youthful lusts that, that kids, that young men have. He says, but that's not his main point. His main point here is grow up. Instead of making excuses for yourself about what you naturally have temptations to do, he says, it's time to grow up. And then he says, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. He says, I want you to pursue that. Those are great things to pursue if you want to grow spiritually. But notice that's not where he ends the sentence. He says, do it with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. He says, I want you to pursue those things with others. Why? Because then you'll be sharp along the way. You'll grow spiritually. You cannot do the Christian life on your own. You, you may think you can, but you will suffer the lack of much. The, it goes on. Hebrews 10, verse 24. He says, and let's consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. He's saying, rather than look for some time by yourself, start looking for time with others. So you can encourage them so they can be a mutual encouragement to you. And then Romans 1. Paul's talking a little bit about the value of gifts. All of us have gifts, spiritual gifts. When you are born again spiritually, you receive a gift, at least one. And God wants you to use that gift to encourage others. Listen to this. Romans 1, verse 11, Paul says to the church in Rome, For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. So he's saying when you are together, this person may be ages more mature than you are, but that doesn't matter. You'll still sharpen each other. He's saying he's in because he knows the value of it. And then there's one last passage I want to show you. And it has to do with God's plan for your life and how spending time with other believers is so instrumental to God's plan for your life. It, Paul writes to the church at Philippi. Philippians 1, verse 6. He says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now stop right there for just a moment. What he's saying there is God has a plan for your life and he's going to work it Every day of your life. He doesn't take a day off. Every day of your life is meant to contribute to your ability to succeed and grow spiritually. That's what he's saying there. 
He says, God has a plan for your life and he's going to work it every day. But then he goes on. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment, you know, he wrote this letter while he was in prison. He wrote Colossians while he was in prison. He wrote uh, Ephesians while he was in prison. Goes on. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. My, for God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. We, we see this throughout the scriptures that believers would come to the prison and bring food to Paul. Sometimes believers would actually be imprisoned with Paul. Sometimes believers would just come and listen to Paul, then they'd go out and share. When you go later on in chapter 1 of Philippians, you see that Paul is so, so impressed and so uh, proud of the Philippians, uh, the Philippian Christians because they're taking the lessons that they're learning from Paul and passing them on. Here Paul is imprisoned. With, with no, it looks really bleak. But they share the word how Paul is able to lead some from the Praetorian Guard. This is the, uh, the emperor's private guard. Some of them were being led to Christ while in prison, while Paul was in prison. So what he's saying is we mutually encourage each other. I needed you and you needed me and it works both ways. You will grow spiritually when you choose to spend time with followers of Jesus. By the way, things haven't changed today. For me, I'm not able to be in one of the small groups that meets on Sunday mornings. But I do meet in small groups, especially with other pastors. Why? Because God's got a plan for my life. And he's working it every day. And if my blade, my, my edge doesn't remain sharp, then I'm wasting his time. So I spend time with other guys who encourage me and share with me and challenge me and prompt me, and they'll get on the phone. I've got, per, I've got uh, accountability partners that, I, that call me and just, they want to know how things are going, and they want to encourage me. They'll tell me something they've learned, and I do the same thing. This doesn't ever stop. You don't ever just arrive. And I think that's some of the misconceptions that believers have, is that spiritual growth means that there's an end. You, you finally will arrive. Well, not until Jesus gets back. Amen. When he comes back, that'll be a glorious day. But until that time, we have a lot of improvement to make. But that's what we're talking about. You want to grow spiritually? You make a commitment to be with other believers. Now, let me say one last thing before we go to the next point. We have this thing called community groups that meets here Sunday mornings. Right now, we have half of them meet right now. While you're in here, there's, another, there's a bunch of people that are meeting in small groups. The first hour, while everybody else was in the first service, there were many of the small groups. Many of you were there. You were in a small group, too. The reason why we do that is because of this vital lesson of spiritual growth. We want to make sure that it's easy for you to jump in. You can come and get to know people. Why is that so important? When you're in a small group like that, then when something's going on in your life that you need somebody to pray for, you have a group there that cares about you, that knows you, and you just say, I need you to pray about this, and they're on it. They're going to pray for you, and, and they're going to help you in what ways they can help you. They're going, to, they're going to be a part of a mission that you're going to be a part of. When you say, hey, I need some help with my neighbors, they'll be the ones, the first, they'll, they'll be the frontliners there to help you with your neighbors. That's what small groups do. They're there to sharpen each other. I want to challenge you, if you're not in one of those small groups, those community groups, then join one. Next week, just come at 9 o'clock and go to one of the small groups and then come to service right now. You're just going to have to get up an hour and a half earlier. I know that's hard, but it's, it's worth it. You'll do that. You watch. You, you will never regret that decision. Never. In fact, it will so encourage you, you'll begin to see some immediate spiritual growth once you start sharpening, being sharpened by another believer. That's why we do that. Now, there's another option. We, we, we only have so much room at this plant here. And, and we're using just about all the rooms. Not all of them right yet. We have room for growth there. But we also know that some of the times the timing, the 9 or the 10.30, are not good times for people to do small groups. Well, that's why we've got a small groups pastor that just came on board last week. And he's going to be putting together a strategy on how to start groups in neighborhoods. And ones that are closer to you. Maybe offered it at a time that would be better for you. And so we're in the process of trying to identify people who would be interested in hosting some of those in their home. People who would be interested in just teaching the Bible study in those homes. Obviously, there's a lot of training and preparation that will be done, and that's, uh, that's what our, uh, our new pastor is going to do is do all that training. We're not expecting you to know everything, but I just want you to know we're doing it because we understand the value of small groups. We understand the, the spiritual principle that says you can't grow without others. You may think you can, and you might be able to do a little jump start, but you're going to fade back. 
God says, I want you to be around other believers. So maybe that's a decision you need to make. If you want to grow spiritually, you need to choose to hang around on a regular basis some other followers of Jesus. Now that brings me to number seven. You will grow spiritually when you choose God's will over your will. You will grow spiritually when you choose God's will over your will. This is huge. This is what's commonly referred to as a theology of the, the lordship of Christ. It's, it's about obedience. It's about will you do what King Jesus says to do. I, w- I want you to see some things. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, Jesus is teaching the disciples to pray. They wanted to know how to pray. And he told them a lot of stuff about prayer. And then he says, here's a model prayer. This kind of incorporates all the different subject matter that I want you to talk about, to talk to God about. And here's what he says. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So he starts off by saying we ought to be praising God, acknowledging that his name is, is above all others. And then it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, you know what he's saying there? He's saying that when you pray, you want to be able to pray to God and say, God, I want what's going on up there to happen right here. I want the way you've got it going on up there, that's what I want you to to make happen down here. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. This is Jesus' way of saying, look, bottom line, the Christian life is one of submission to Jesus. He does change everything. He brings forgiveness. He brings a new start. He gives you grace and mercy, all those things. But understand, in the course of following Jesus, it's going to involve submission to Jesus, obedience to Jesus. That's not easy to take because we want to be in charge. We want to be our own boss. And God says, there's only one God in this room, and it's not you or me. It's God. So What we're talking about here is if you want to grow spiritually, you have got to come to the point where you say, yes, sir, I'm all in. I'll do whatever you want me to do. You can always offer your opinions. You can always talk to him. God has big shoulders. He can handle any comments that you have about what he's telling you to do. But but when it comes down to it, what you choose to do is an issue of obedience. And God says, I want you to obey me. Now, there's another verse I want you to hear. Jesus is trying to explain this because he doesn't want to, to paint a Pollyanna picture of Christianity. Some people come to Christ because they think, no longer will I ever feel guilty again, and I'm going to have a, I'm going to have everything I need, and Jesus is just so nice to me, and he's never going to let anybody hurt my feelings ever again. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He, Jesus, was saying to them all, the disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. To take up your cross, I mean, that's a tough one. There's nothing easy about that at all. What he's saying is the things I'm going to require of you are not going to make sense to you a lot of the time. The things that he's going to require of us are going to cause us great pain. But if he says to do it, we need to obey him. We need to say yes to him. Whether you understand it or not is beside the point. The point is, do you trust him or not? He is the Lord. And, he, and, he, and that's his way of warning. He says, the Christian life is not an easy life to live. He says, you're taking up your cross. You're willing to die daily to self in order that God gets his way in your life. You're thinking, that doesn't sound fair. What's not fair about it? God's creator of heaven and earth. He made you for himself. He made all of us for himself. But it's not easy. I grant it. It's, it's not easy to have to, to say yes to God when everything inside of you wants to say no. But God says, if you want to grow spiritually, you've got to come to the point where you say yes. Here's what Jesus says. He, and he, he, what he does is he describes obedience in terms of spiritual growth. He says in John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and then here it comes, and I will disclose myself to him. Jesus is saying, if if you have my commandments and keep them, that demonstrates your love for me. So love is not just, I mean, obedience is not just I'm doing this because, no, you do it because you love him, but you obey him. 
Sometimes you wish you didn't have to do it, but you still do it because you love him. He's saying, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. What God is saying is, when you live in obedience, knowing that it's a tough, tough road to take, he says, when you do that, I am going to personally manifest myself to you in a way that you'll learn more about me than you've ever learned before. I'm going to open your eyes so you can see me in ways that you've never seen me before. That's what he's saying there. He says, you're going to grow spiritually. You're going to know more and more about what God is like and his plan for your life because you chose to obey him. Whereas if you choose to disobey him, you get off track, then you're frustrated and wonder, where in the world's God? God says, I'm right here, but you've got to trust me in this. There's a couple things that happen in my life that drive this this principle home to me personally. You know, since the only church I, you know, my, my pastor was Charles Stanley in Atlanta, Georgia, when I first became a Christian. That's the first church I ever went to. It's a big church. Well, when I moved from there, I was on staff at that church, and I moved from there to go to seminary in Texas. So, and the church I went to in Texas, they had about 2,000 people in attendance there. So the only church I'd ever been a part of were huge churches. I didn't know there were, there were, little, there were little churches too. I, mean, I just figured they were all big like that because now I'm a new believer and everybody's excited about Jesus in every one of those churches and, and some just want to be in small churches, some want to be, be, be in big churches. So I go, to, I go to seminary and I don't know any different because I don't have the background, but I'm thinking, I believe God's called me in a ministry and I'm going to be a pastor like the pastor I had. Okay, I'm going to be that kind of a pastor. So I'm getting training and I'm going through all this and then it gets to the last month of my seminary education and I'm there and... I'm just waiting for God to open up a door and say, here's the church you're going to be the senior pastor at. But it didn't happen. I get this call from the office there, the seminary, saying there's this team of people from Oklahoma that want to talk to you about possibly coming to the church. I says, oh, great. I'd be glad to. I mean, uh, what else? And says, well, they, they want you to consider a minister of youth and evangelism position. Really? I've not done any of those. Uh, says, well, I tell you what I do. I, I have a lot of friends that I work with here at school that uh, are very much that wanting to be a youth pastor, and I'd be glad to recommend them. I can tell them, I'll be glad to meet with them there for that reason. They said, okay, and they agree. So we sit there around the table for hours just talking, and they're asking me all these questions. I'm answering the questions, but when it gets to ministry questions, I say, well, I know my friend John. If he did it, he'd do it this way. This is the way he's doing it where he is, and that's how that would work. And on and on, and we went. We get to the end of the interview process, and, they, and the committee there says, all right, we've decided you're the guy that we'd like to come to our church. What? But I'm, I'm not, I don't believe God's calling me to be a minister of evangelism and youth. I mean, what is, I'm going to go be a pastor where I preach on Sundays. And, uh, and uh, I went home to Cindy, told Cindy the whole story. And, and Cindy, as always, would say, you better pray about that one. And so we prayed. And when I was praying, God spoke to me. And he says, listen, you don't tell me where to use you. I made you for myself. And this is where I want you to go. But God, I don't have any idea what I'd be doing there. He says, I'm sending you there to prepare you for the next place years later. But in the meantime, you're going to make a difference there. And reluctantly, I did not want to do it, but I knew God was telling me to do it. So I told them. We moved up there. Cindy said, what in the world have you got me into now? You know, and, and, but, but she, we went there. That church was so passionate about evangelism and training people in evangelism. They were one of the first churches in Oklahoma that did the EE, Evangelism Explosion. So I learned about that. And I thought, this is, a, this is really great stuff. And so we had groups all through the week. We didn't just have them meet once a week. We had three groups meeting during different times of the week. And I, I was learning that. I learned about student ministry and, and uh, how, how all the nuances there. And so we did all that. And I saw a lot of the youth come to Christ and thought, this is great. But I prayed the whole three and a half years that I was there. God, aren't you ready to put me in the senior pastor? I'm ready. He says, when you learn... And so I learned all those things not knowing, you know, how this all fit. And then finally a church calls in, in Dayton, Ohio, for me to come as their senior pastor. And I, and I knew God was in it. There, we, there's a whole other story with that. But I knew God was in it, so I went. And while we're there, I'm pastoring this church. I'm having a ball. I'm having a great time. I'm preaching. We're seeing lots of people come to Christ. The church is growing like crazy. And it's just a wonderful experience. And then I get this phone call from the director of evangelism for the Ohio Baptist Convention. And he calls and says, Mike, I'd like you to come and be my associate. And I said, that's so nice of you to think about it, but I don't have anything to do with the denomination. That's where the Pharisees live. You know, that's what the Pharisees do. You know, I am a pastor at heart. Don't, I, don't ask me. I, go find somebody else. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. He says, would you pray about it? I'll pray about it, but I know God, this is not what God's prepared me for. And so we said goodbye. 
And I prayed about it, and I just kind of pushed it aside. There's no way God would want that. In the meantime, I had all these churches, a dozen churches, contact me within about a month, wanting to know if I would be willing to move and go to their church. And saying, well, it's better than the the denomination office. And so I talked to each one of them, and it became very clear this was not where God wanted me. So at the end of that time, throughout that time, every month, I'd get a phone call from the denomination office by the director of evangelism. Well, have you changed your mind yet? Will God let you come? Nope. Forget me. Go find somebody else. The next month, same thing. Next month, same thing. Over those six months. In the meantime, I'm talking to all these other churches, and it becomes clear that I'm not to do that, and then I get the call from this. And what's so funny is that morning, it was a Friday morning, I had my quiet time with the Lord, and I was praying about this thing, and I thought, you know, maybe God's wanting me to do this. I can't see why, but maybe he is. I tell you what, if that guy calls me one more time, I'll talk to him. And I felt this peace. I told Cindy, this was Friday morning, my day off. If that guy calls me, I'll talk to him. She says, all right. So we go off, and then we get back. It's quarter to five in the afternoon. We're walking in the door, and the phone's ringing. I answer the phone, and it's Jeff, the director of evangelism. He says, me and the executive director have been here, and we've been praying about you one more time. And I know you've said no, 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 no. But I told him, we just need to call one more time. Well, the history is that I went and I was there for 10 years. And the whole 10 years I was there, I was griping and complaining to God, why have you got me here? And God would say the same thing. I am preparing you to work now, but also to work later. And I didn't see it at all. But God blessed those previous 10 years. And I I learned so much. And the friendships that I gained in the course of that time with all these pastors. And I thought, this is a wonderful thing. And then all of a sudden, a church contacted me and says, we want to reach the world. We want to do whatever it takes to reach our community and the world. We believe the Bible cover to cover. And we just need somebody to lead us. You know who that church was? Sarasota Baptist Church. And And I began to look. What I've been doing the last 10 years, I worked with churches that ran 10,000 people down to 50 people. I learned how to develop evangelistic strategies for communities, how you reach them. And all of that needed to be applied here. The stuff on evangelism I learned at the other church. And I began to put it all together. God knew exactly what he was doing. He knew it. But the only reason why it happened is because I stood up and said, yes, sir, I'll do it. Yes, Lord. You're telling me to go to Oklahoma? Never been there before, and it gets really hot there. But I'll go. Then go to Ohio. Where in the world is Ohio? I I never lived anywhere close to that. My dad was in the military. We traveled all around. We never got north, uh, anywhere north or northeast or any of that stuff. It was always south or overseas. Where is Ohio? And they want me to deal with all these churches. Who am I? I'm just young. But God knew what he was doing. And I said, yes, sir, I'm willing to do it. And God used it in my life to prepare me to be your pastor. Now, he hadn't stopped. He still works me over constantly, sharpening me. That's why I go to these retreats for pastors on occasion, and I spend time with these guys, and I tell them, ask me the the questions, the hard questions, and I want to, let's talk about those things. Why? Because I know that I need to be in a position where I can say, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask. Now, you're probably wondering, what about the other blanks? We're not going to cover those today. You want, to, you want to hear the rest of them? You've got to come back next week, all right? And maybe the next week, for that matter. I told you, the more time you give me, the more of these points I've got. Please know that God wants you to grow. Please know this, too, that much of the reason you're not growing is because you're not saying yes to God or you're not spending time with other followers who you've given permission to be direct with you about your spiritual condition. And any one of those other previous five points, too, for that matter. When we choose to ignore what causes spiritual growth, then we just stag- get stagnant. Um, stagnant, whatever the word is. We, we end up getting stifled. That's the word I was looking for. We're stifled, and we can't go any further, and we wonder, where in the world's God? God's in the same place he's always been. But he's going to ask you to do some things that you don't particularly care to do. But you must if you're going to grow. I must if I'm going to grow. So let me say this. All these things that we've been talking about, they all assume that you've already taken the first step. The first step is this. You come to God and say, I am a sinner. And I believe that Jesus died on that cross for my sin. I believe he really died there and fulfilled the obligation of God's moral law, the wages of sin is death, for me. And I know that three days later he came back to life again. And now he offers me forgiveness 
A offers me a brand new life. I accept. If That's where it all begins. Until you accept that gift that he offers, you don't do anything to get it other than just to receive it by faith. When you accept that, then you can apply these other principles. If you don't do that first and just try to apply the principles, you're going to get frustrated because you are powerless. When you receive Christ, he sends his spirit to live inside of you and to empower you. You must have him living in you if you're going to live that kind of life. It's not possible any other way. So I encourage you, if you've not given your life to Christ, do that today. And then start moving down the road and apply these spiritual principles here. All right? Let's stand together quietly as I lead us in prayer.